Hello there, my fellow battle brothers, and welcome to this week's not so obscure anymore chapter of Adeptus Astartes. Just like I promised in my previous episode of the series, I have now started covering Tier 2 chapters. If you don't know what a Tier 2 chapter is, don't worry, I won't explain this every time. It is chapters of Space Marines that will take anywhere between 1 and 4 episodes to cover. I have replied to some of you in my Fire Angels video, but I'll say it again here, concerning the method I'll use to deal with these Tier 2 chapters. So I decided to go with 2 videos a week, until a chapter is finished, that means one every Saturday, and another one randomly during the week. This will not be a permanent approach, however, because I also want to alternate between Tier 2 and Tier 3 chapters as I go along. But enough with explanations. That is not why you're here. The chapter I'll start covering today, after many requests from a certain subscriber, is called The Storm Wardens. It will take about 3 videos, by my estimation, to describe them fully, and today we're starting with a bit of their history. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn a couple of things about the Storm Wardens, shall we? The Storm Wardens is a Codex Astartes compliant Loyalist Space Marine chapter of unknown origin and founding located on the forbidden world of Sacris in the Calixis sector. The Storm Wardens are the stoic defenders of humanity, often found upon the borders of the Imperium. Until recently, these Astartes were most focused upon the Great Warp Storms, which troubled the Halo Stars region. They are a highly insular chapter, and there are only a handful of monuments and Imperial records outside of their fortress monastery that celebrate their long list of battle honors. While many of the chapters serving in the Jericho Reach's Achilles Crusade are well known across the Imperium, the Storm Wardens are one of the chapters in existence whose deeds go largely unrecorded, whose activities are confined to a relatively contained theater of operations, or whose histories are as yet largely unwritten. In the case of the Storm Wardens, there is an additional reason why their name is not well known a tale of calamity known as the Nemesis Incident, of which very few have any inkling. But it is not just the events of the Nemesis Incident that have kept the Storm Wardens from becoming the celebrated heroes that they arguably deserve to be. Some would say that they have inherited much of the taciturn, ever-dour nature of the tribesmen of Sacris from which they recruit aspirants and this would certainly go a long way towards explaining why the Storm Wardens appear to shun the laurels they are undoubtedly due. Sacris is a world forbidden to all but the Storm Wardens, and its warring clans exist at a very precipice of survival. They are distrustful of outsiders, and utterly relentless in war. The Storm Wardens have inherited these and many more aspects of the tribes of Sacris, granting them a unique blend of qualities. One of the most obvious manifestations of the chapter's desire to keep much of its identity a secret is to be found in the manner in which it administers its home world of Sacris. This gloomy world is located within the borders of the Calixis sector, but those gazetteers that even list it describe it as a forbidden world. Beyond its name, most navigators and free captains have no knowledge of the world, and no need to approach it. Were they to do so, they would be challenged by an outer ring of automated defense monitors, dire warnings against proceeding any further, transmitted into the void. Anyone foolish enough to proceed into the system's inner zone finds something entirely unexpected. Hostile patrols of space marine vessels. Sadly for the intruders, the Storm Wardens do not repeat the warnings transmitted by the automated monitors, opening fire immediately and with deadly effect. 
So deep is the chapter's desire to remain isolated from the other worlds of the Calixus sector that very few Calixian authorities and institutions are even aware that a Space Marine chapter exists among them. Exactly how many know of the Storm Wardens is unclear, but certainly the fact is not common knowledge, even in the highest echelons of the Administratum mission in the sector. Furthermore, it seems unbelievable that the Inquisitions or those Calixes would not be aware of an entire Space Marine chapters operating within their sphere of influence. Yet there appear to be no links between the two groups, neither formal nor informal. While the Storm Wardens are not known to have undertaken any direct missions alongside agents of the Ordo Calixus, they have fought alongside Inquisitors in many different war zones, which is suggestive of some deeper mystery which may be in play. Next, we're gonna discuss the so-called Nemesis Incident, which happens to have shaped a lot of this chapter's history. In 945 of M36, the Storm Wardens aided the Inquisition in operation against an infestation of enslavers, which are psychic entities from the warp in the Steropis Cluster. What came to pass in that place and its ancient ruins is unknown, but shortly after the Storm Wardens returned to Sacris, something endangered the chapter and potentially the Imperium itself. At the conclusion of the Nemesis incident, the Storm Wardens chapter master Owen Glendweir discussed with an Inquisitor Lord of the Ordo Xenos what needed to be done. A dire decision was made. By the authority of the High Lords of Terra, Glendweir had much of the interior of the Storm Wardens Fortress Monastery on their home world of Sacris's Moon of High Castle sealed. All records of their history, the Primarch from which they descended, and the date of the chapter's founding were destroyed or hidden very well. Furthermore, the Storm Warden's homeworld of Sacris was forbidden to have any contact with the Imperium at large. Following this, according to the only record of the time that still exists, the sacred history of the chapter, called the Liber Tempest, Many Storm Wardens, including the entire Veteran First Company and Chapter Master Owen Glendweir himself, were placed in hidden stasis vaults. The Chapter's venerable dreadnoughts have taken a vow of silence, and they stand guard over these hidden chambers. The only detail of this event, that would later become known as the Nemesis Incident, are to be found within the pages of the Liber Tempest a 77-volume tome describing the deeds of the chapter and the lives of its heroes through the turbulent years of the Age of Apostasy in the late 36th millennium. This mighty book was authored by Chief Librarian Bryn Maxson, who had himself become so crippled in body during the fighting that he was capable of no more service to the chapter, other than committing his wisdom to parchment. It is said that Maxon held death at bay for 12 years as he recited the Liber Tempest to his disciples in the Librarius, each of his followers transcribing the words faithfully. Yet, the very fact that several versions of the Liber Tempest were written simultaneously led to an ear schism within the Librarius after Maxon's death. When the texts were studied in detail, it was discovered that they differed from one another in several major details. The differences were not mere errors of transcription, but were so great that Maxon's successor came to suspect some outside agency of deliberately corrupting the transcription process. Following the discovery of the divergent accounts of the Nemesis incident, the senior members of the Librarius undertook a process of determining which of them, if any, were real. This process took the best part of a standard century, and was made all but impossible by the facts of the incident itself. Eventually, one single version of Maxon's account was declared the real one, and the others labeled apocryphal and locked away. Each one of these divergent tomes became known by the name of the librarian that had compiled it, such as the Apocrypha of Yorath, the Book of Ainion, and the Liber Esoterica Catfanius. The Liber Tempest details the calamitous events of the Age of Apostasy, as experienced by the Storm Warden's chapter. 
The Nemesis incident represents a brief but dramatic period within the turbulent epoch, and the Liber presents very few details of it. The roots of the incident are to be found in the general increase in warp activity that afflicted the Imperium in the run-up to the Age of Apostasy. Trade routes, the length and breadth of the galaxy, became all but impassable. Entire war fleets and crusading armies were lost, as the warp routes they were traveling were overcome by impossible energies. In many areas, the raw stuff of the warp bled through the thin skin of reality and engulfed entire systems. The more fortunate ones were simply cut off from all outside contact. The less fortunate were saturated in the terrible unreality of the warp, entire populations spontaneously mutating or falling victim to apocalyptic demonic incursions. Aside from aetheric overbleed, genetic mutation and demonic incursion, warp storms sometimes bring with them the risk of another, thankfully very rare, but utterly devastating threat. There exist in the depths of the warp entities other than what men call demons. Enslavers are one such form a nightmarish hybrid of the Xenos and the Demonic that exists for most of its life cycle within the Empyrean, but breeds and multiplies in real space. Enslavers utilize the minds of untrained psychers, transforming their victims' bodies into vast, distended gateways through which the enslavers themselves pour out of the warp. Even more, they are able to take control of the bodies of their foes, turning them into drooling mind slaves. When warp storm activity increases, so too do the rates of psyker births, and so the age of apostasy was underpinned by a second horror, that of enslaver infestation. This, much of the various versions of the Liber Tempest all agree upon, but the accounts began to diverge at the point when the chapter was committed to a region of space known as the Steropis Cluster. Most versions of the Liber Tempest agree that the Storm Warden's chapter master, Owen Glendweir, took his army to the Steropis Cluster in response to a reading of the Emperor's Tarot, made by the Chief Librarian. Other texts call this into question, insinuating that the deployment may have been carried out at the behest of the Inquisition or some other mysterious Imperial faction. Having reached the Steropis Cluster, it is said that the Storm Wardens discovered a swathe of worlds entirely consumed by the roiling power of the warp. Those worlds lying on the outskirts of the storm had come under the dominion of the largest enslaver plague the Segmentum had ever seen. Once again, the various accounts of the war are different in their descriptions of what followed. The Liber Esoterica Cadfanius contains a detailed account of Glendweir and an unnamed Inquisitor Lord exploring a series of ruins across several of the cluster's worlds, and this is corroborated by the Liber Tempest itself. No account of the ruins gives any suggestion as to which alien race built them, but all describe their holes as black and oppressive and completely dwarfing even the space marines. At some point during the exploration of these ruins, it appears that the Storm Wardens and an allied Inquisitorial force came under attack, first by a horde of enslaved human meat puppets, and then by the enslavers themselves. The Chapter Master and the First Company fought a series of desperate battles against them, during which many heroic battle brothers were lost. Three entire worlds were cleansed by the Xeno's presence, but ultimately the Inquisitor Lord declared a writ of exterminatus on seven more before the cluster was declared purged of the enslaver plague. In the aftermath of the Steropis cluster campaign, the Storm Wardens returned home. Yet, by a reading of a number of the Apocrypha, it appears that the taint had not entirely been purged, and that the first company had in fact brought it back with them to the Calixis sector. According to the Book of Ainian, a number of the First Company veterans had become corrupted by some form of psychic taint, which was only uncovered during post-battle cleansing protocol. The chapter's most senior apothecaries, chaplains and librarians turned all their efforts to purging this taint, 
But according to Ainian's account, the taint was too ingrained and presented a dire threat to the survival of the entire chapter. Initially, the Inquisitor Lord was of the view that those infected should submit to voluntary liquidation. Yet the Storm Warden's senior officers obviously argued against it, and Glendweir proposed a compromise. Everyone who was tainted was to be placed in stasis in the vaults of the chapter monastery. The Inquisition placed one condition on their acquiescence, however demanding that the chapter's homeworld be isolated from the Greater Imperium and all knowledge of the Nemesis incident be purged from Imperial records. There were a number of side effects to the sealing of the vaults and the isolation of Sacris. Firstly, many of the chapter's oldest archives were sealed along with the First Company, so that millennia later the Storm Wardens themselves became ignorant as to many details of their own history. Even more, a number of legends have evolved around the incident, which form the basis of some of the chapter's most cherished rituals. One such legend states that the long-lost brothers of the First Company will one day return, when the very existence of the chapter and the Imperium is threatened. The chapter's beliefs call upon its members to be ever vigilant for such a time and to meet with honor and stoicism every challenge the galaxy can throw at them. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Storm Wardens and this Nemesis incident from their history for today. There is much more to be said about this chapter, like their campaigns, their beliefs, organization, combat doctrine, and more. All things that I will cover in future videos of them. What are your thoughts on this chapter and their sealed history? Let me know in the comments below. Was this video enjoyable or informative? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you all an amazing day. The Emperor Protects.